What a pair of crops we have to share with you today. I believe it will put a cherry on top of the rest of your day. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Liz Colby and I'm with Practical Farmers of Iowa. Accompanying me behind the scenes and providing technical support is Celise Christie. We will shortly be broadcasting live with Tom Wall and Kathy Dice of Red Fern Farm in Wapalo, Iowa. A few weeks ago, Tom and Kathy took us on a tour of their honeyberry plants. And today we're going to explore two crops ripe right now, cornelian cherries and Asian pears. But first, like an old movie, we start with the credits at the top. We'd like to thank our major sponsors for their support of our virtual of field their field. honeyberry plants. And today we're going to Whoa, explore let me get two that turned off. There we go. Uh, this, virtual field, this virtual field day season uh, features over 60 virtual field days. And with the support of our sponsors, you can attend all of them free of charge. So thank you, sponsors. And Practical Farmers of Iowa is a farmer-led nonprofit based out of Ames. We specialize in farmer-to-farmer -farmer knowledge sharing and farmer-led research with a mission to equip farmers to build resilient farms and communities. All are welcome at PFI. We invite you to learn more about our organization and access our vast collection of resources at practicalfarmers.org. This virtual field day will run until 1.05. If you have questions for Tom and Kathy during the field day, please type them into the comment box on Facebook, and I'll do my best to relay them to Tom and Kathy during our discussion. And at the conclusion of this event, please give us your feedback via the online survey. Celise will post that in the comment box. Virtual events are new to us in 2020, like most people. Uh, and with your help, we're excited to learn and improve throughout the summer. So let's go live to Tom and Kathy. Get that video switched over. All right, hello. Hey, I, I, like, I like the cherry comment. That was very good, Liz. Uh, thank you guys uh, for hosting us today. I'm gonna just turn the reins over to you. Go ahead. Ooh, all right. So we are Kathy Dice and Tom Wall from Red Fern Farm down here in Southeast Iowa. And we've had our Cornelian cherries ripe for about how many weeks now? About a month. This is one of the first crops that we have that we have our UFIT customers coming to harvest and not quite ripe yet, but we will be talking this, about this it. This is ripe. Oh, this one's ripe. And is our Asian pears. And anything else you want to say, Tom, before we start our videos? I'm, I would say let's start. But Liz, anything you want to say? Well, I would just say maybe in case these folks are first time tuners into a Red Fern Farm field day, uh, remind them what crops you grow. And uh, <laughs> oh, we only have half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> we grow a lot of different things on our farm. The big cash crops are our chestnut trees, pawpaws, then heartnuts, American persimmons, Asian pears, Asian pears, and hopefully soon honeyberries. Honeyberries, also cornelian cherries add to that, and hazels, black walnut. But we're into perennials big time. We awesome. plant trees and we keep the ground constantly covered. It's a good way of farming for the environment and very profitable most years. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Well, let's get into talking about the cherries and the pears. Go ahead. Okay. Now, we'll, let's start with the Cornelian cherries. Let's... You might want to see the video first time because you've oh. covered a lot of this. So we're going to start with that Cornelian okay. cherry video. And you'll be able to tell. My okay. so these are Cornelian cherries. And they're actually a kind of dogwood, not at all related to true cherries. But these have some big advantages over real cherries in that they don't have the disease and pest problems that true cherries have. And they're just as good, if not better, than actual cherries. Heavily productive. Yeah, a little bit more challenging to pit than two cherries. Now when they're bright red and attractive looking like this one here, they're not actually ripe yet. They're not ripe until the berry actually turns very dark and soft like this one. This is a good example of a 
ripe cornelian cherry. Here's one that's not ripe yet. It's still nice and firm, but this will ripen off the tree. Uh, just sitting at room temperature for a day or two, it will finish ripening and then be good to eat. They're very tart before they're fully ripe, so much like true cherry. I do not recommend these as a commercial crop, though, because they're very poorly known in the U.S., and although they are a valuable commercial crop, especially in Southwest Asia, like in Turkey and, and Eastern Europe. Uh, Americans have never heard of these, aren't familiar with them, and probably aren't going to be willing to pay much, if anything, for them, no matter how good they are. So these are good for home use, for making pies and jams and jellies and smoothies and such like, but don't think you're going to be able to sell these for a cash crop. much for that. <laughs> so, um, oh, and Cecile, would you go ahead and run Cecile. through, Celise, would you run through the um, slideshow we have of the uh, UPIC customers on the Cornelian cherries? One thing we noticed is these cherries are from seedlings and wild type, wild type, Cornelian cherries. The ones that you saw at the beginning of the video are bigger. And those are from grafted bushes of cornelian cherries. So the season goes long for these seedling guys because we have a lot of them. And some are ripen early, some are ripening late, some will ripen two weeks later from right now. The grafted varieties are already all gone. They ripened early in the year. They got picked fast and hard because they were so big. And now we're at the seedling types, but we still charge $2 a pound to customers who are harvesting these seedling ones for, as well as the grafted ones. And these are some slideshows of some of our UPIC customers. These folks came out on Labor Day, a family of homeschool kids and their relatives. And they had a fun day out here picking. And this was some other folks who came up from Texas 
to buy some trees from us who also went out and harvested hazels and cornelian cherries. So, and, Colin, Kathy, how old are the trees that you're harvesting off, or the, the bushes, I guess, that you're harvesting off? That's a well, good question. I think they were originally planted in 2008, so maybe 12 years old. Uh, the, the grafted ones were grafted probably uh, six to eight years ago. So. And how, how quickly do the grafted uh, shrubs start bearing fruit? Uh, Cornelian cherries are a, a bit slow to come into production compared to a lot of other fruit trees. Uh, maybe six to eight years uh, to this first, first fruit. And there's some questions. I know you use that shaker attachment on the reciprocating saw for honey berries as well. Um, and it's, I don't know if you brought it in the room with you, probably not, but um, maybe we'll bring it over in for your next field day. Can you tell us what you made that of and how you got it to fit into your reciprocating saw? Well, it, it's just a battery operated uh, cordless reciprocating saw. Um, Sawzall is a is, is what people call them a lot because that's the company that uh, first developed that saw. But, uh, and then I took a, a metal rod and made a, a couple of hooks on the end. And then I glued that metal rod <laughs> to the saw blade. I, I should have welded it in, in hindsight <clears throat> because the glue did not hold up and the, the rod came off uh, during the harvest of the cornelian cherries. As so. you saw. I see. Yep. Okay. <laughs> and um, I know you want to get moving on to the Asian pears, um, but are there um, any, you know, pruning things that should be done for, for cherries? That of and how you got it to fit into your reciprocating saw? Well, it, it's just a battery operator. I know you want to get moving on to the Asian pears. We're getting a little echo from Saliza's uh, video there, maybe. So. <laughs> anyway, uh, so pruning on the cherries. Um, you, you don't have to do any pruning on the cornelian cherries, but if you want to be able to uh, reach the fruit from the ground, you may want to just uh, cut the tops off of them periodically so that uh, they don't get too tall. Other than that, they don't need the, the type of pruning that uh, crops like apple and pear and peach and cherry and plum and apricot uh, need every year. And don't need spraying. Yes, these also don't don't need any spraying. And these taste good. These is <laughs> one important. of the few things that we grow on our farm that our son and daughter like to eat. <laughs> not nut heads, huh? <laughs> <laughs> not, no. And I don't um, anything else they like to eat. <laughs> they like the. High bush cranberries. High bush cranberries, which gag a lot of people, but these are good. These are good. Okay, sorry. No, no problem. And what was the what's the variety, the grafted variety that uh, that you like? Uh, well, there's there's several grafted varieties. Um, well, we have three uh, grafted or varieties that are grown for their fruit anyway on the farm. Uh, the one I like the best is Pioneer. It has a fruit about uh, four times larger than this. Like, here's a, a wild type fruit. The Pioneer has fruit four times bigger than that. And it's really good. <clears throat> um, another good one is Red Star and also uh, Elegant. Uh, and there, there are other varieties too, but those are the three that we have on the farm. It's important. One of the drawbacks of Cornelian cherries is the site of the seed seed as you can see here it's a big seed well like a cherry pit. yeah i think cherry well okay but it's a big seed <laughs> all right all right awesome well i don't see any more questions coming in the chat box about uh cherries so why don't we move on to asian pears yay yes, yes. asian pears <clears throat> let's roll the video we're much more excited on these Woo! we have cherries rolling across the desk <laughs> Oh, there we go. This is Asian pear, Korean giant. Uh, Asian pears are a good commercial crop for Iowa. Uh, more productive than apples, much easier to grow than apples. They don't require a lot of spraying like apples do. 
and require just a fraction of the pruning apples take. Uh, but best of all is they're much more valuable than apples. They sell by the fruit instead of by the pound. And typically the prices for Asian pears at retail level range from $1.50 to $8.50 per fruit. And they're heavily productive. In fact, uh, one of the biggest limitations of Asian pears is the fruit needs to be thinned heavily uh, by hand or the fruit will be undersized and under flavored. Uh, this is an example of a Korean giant pear that did not get, get thinned and you can see the fruit load on it is really heavy and the fruit size is a little bit smaller than it should be. Another important thing about Asian pears is you need to select varieties that are resistant to fire blight. Um, many Asian pears are highly susceptible to fire blight and it will kill them. Uh, Korean giant is quite resistant to fire blight. Also Shinko is resistant. And uh, Suri and Suli Asian pears are resistant to fire blight. But many of the other varieties are highly susceptible. Fire blight. Fire blight resistant varieties include Korean giant, Suri, Suli, and Shinko. They're hard to spell. This is <clears throat> Nijiseki Asian pear. And in my opinion, it's the best flavored, but this is one I do not recommend for Iowa because it is fire blight susceptible. But uh, this is one Asian pear that has a, a strong color break, so the, the fruit turns from green to yellow when they're ripe. Uh, not all Asian pears change color when they ripen. So there is ripe and unripe fruit on that tree right there. I couldn't quite see the difference. Here's how you tell if an Asian pear is ripe. Cut it open with a knife. Look at the seeds. If the seeds are dark brown, then the pear is ripe. Hey. All right. And you said one of these, oh, you can actually see the color break. Okay. Um, those are different varieties. Okay. So what variety is this, Tom? Oh, let me, don't hold so. <laughs> He's got <Okay. laughs> This is an, an example of an unripe Korean giant. Korean giant mm -hmm. is very late ripening. This will not ripen until late October, the, the last half of October. Is it likely to um, get bigger? It'll probably get a little bit bigger, but uh, this came from that that tree that had an excessive crop load on it. So the fruit will not size up quite like it should. Uh, uh, Korean giant should be about four times bigger than this actually. Like that one. You can talk about these. So. Korean giant. Here, here's a ripe Shinko Ooh. pear. And this is one of the um, light resistant varieties. And one I, one I recommend, although it does tend to be the most heavily productive. So it needs the heaviest thinning in order to get good fruit size. But this is a good fruit size for our Shinko yeah. Asian pear. And usually the Korean giant would be much larger than the Shinko. That's the yeah. name, Korean yeah. giant. Two, two to three times bigger than Shinko. And <clears throat> here's a ripe Nijiseki pear. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> this is one that's, uh, this is a very good tasting one. I'm looking for my knife. It's not one that I recommend for Iowa because it is blight susceptible. Uh, in fact, this is, came from the tree in the video. And I think that's the only Nijiseki tree we have on the farm that produced any fruit And you this think year. it's ripe? It is ripe. Yay, okay. Questions? Um, do they, uh, did the Asian pears ripen pretty uniformly on the tree? Like if you cut into one, will you know if the others on the tree are um, really ripe? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's likely, uh, and it probably varies from one variety to another, but it, it's likely that if one fruit is ripe on an Asian pear tree, the rest of them are, are ripe also or, or very close to it. 
Um, and I can't, I, you may have said this in the video, but do they, will they ripen, they ripen on the counter also if you pick it a little early? Um, uh, normally Asian pears are ripened on the tree and, and you don't pick them until they are fully ripe. And that make, that's different from uh, apples and European pears that are uh, often picked when they're mature, but not ripe and then ripened off the mm. tree. And for people who haven't eaten an Asian pear, and Kathy is now eating it, it sounds a bit more crisp, like toward an apple and less like a European pear. Yes. Um, European, European pears are soft when they're ripe, almost like a, like a ripe peach. Um, Asian pears are crunchy when they're ripe uh, with a texture more like an apple. And the reason I got excited is the first time I had a Najis, Najiseki. 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 It had overtones of cloves and allspice, along with sweetness and tartness. It was fantastic. This one's actually kind of bland in comparison to what I remember, but it's pretty good. Mm. And when Tom, you, what about what about seedlings versus grafted for the Asian pear? Um, well, uh, a seedling Asian pear is not likely going to be commercially valuable. They're, they're a lot more like apples in that respect. And only one in a million apple seedling trees will grow up into a tree that's valuable. Gotcha. Uh, so, but uh, seedling pears are good to use for rootstocks for grafting good varieties onto them. But uh, with, with a, if you're going to grow Asian pears, you need to select mm -hmm. uh, grafted varieties and then either buy them already grafted or graft them yourself. You don't want to rely on seedlings for Asian pear production. I'm and I know that, go ahead, I'm Kathy. Demonstrate how these haven't been sprayed, but you can't see any like coddling moth damage or any worms or tunneling. It's just really nice, wholesome fruit. In sharp contrast to our apples that oh. get sprayed that are all wormy and deformed. Yeah, I'm from. I, I have some apples like that too. Um, I, so I know you don't use sprays and you thin by hand. Would it be possible if someone wanted to use um, a chemical thinner, would that work on Asian pears like it would on apples? No. No? No. Oh, uh, excuse me. Uh, chemical thinners are, are not very effective on Asian pears. Okay. And so when you thin by hand, um, are, how much fruit are you trying to take off? About half the load or? It depends on the variety. You, you have a goal of getting, ending up with uh, one fruit every six to eight inches of branch center to center. And uh, Asian pears produce their fruit on fruiting spurs, which are short stubby branches. And uh, typically those, shoot, those fruiting spurs are about two inches apart on the branch. And then each fruiting spur will try and set 12 to 15 fruit. <laughs> <clears throat> so you have to thin off a very, a, a large majority of the fruit, at least on some varieties. It varies from one variety to another. Shinko tends to be the most overproductive. And if not thinned heavily, the, the fruit just won't be any good. Uh, Korean giant is probably the, the least overproductive of our varieties. And I only have to thin off about 90% of its fruit. And the first time I had the Nijiseki, it was on a small tree that only had like eight or 10 fruit. And that was one reason it was so flavorful. And after we ate that one, we were gonna harvest the next day and a raccoon came and got all that delicious ripe fruit. Mortal and enemy. I left the, left the <laughs> Shinko fruit that was right next to it completely untouched <laughs> yeah. because they hadn't been thinned and they were- They tasted over, like water balloons. Overproductive and had no flavor. And are you thinning these at um, sort of crab apple size stage or how, how soon are you thinning these in the year? Um, it would probably be better to thin them at the crab apple stage, but- uh, If you get it done at any time, it's, it'll help. Yeah, any time before the fruit's ripe, it, it'll help. But the, the earlier done, the better. All right. I'm getting some questions in the comment box about where people can buy Asian pear trees, uh, particularly this person's in Illinois, and also mm -hmm. asking if you're selling cherry trees for planting or cherry bushes, perhaps for planting this fall. 
no, <laughs> we're, we're not selling Cornelian cherries. Um, well, I can recommend a source for Cornelian, Cornelian cherries and a different source for Asian pears. Um, see, there's, there's a couple sources for Cornelian cherries I could re recommend. One would be One Green World in Oregon, I believe, and uh, uh, Rain Tree Nursery, which is in either Washington or Oregon, I can't remember which. Rain Tree and One Green World for Cornelian cherries. Uh, they will also have Asian pears, but you can get Asian pears more economically, especially on a commercial scale from um, Cummins Nursery in New York. That's backwards. Turn it around. <laughs> in green world. And rain, rain tree. Rain tree. Great. I got those in the chat box and someone else had also typed in coming. Is it Cummins or Cummings? Cummins. C-U-M-M-I-N-S. All right. Fantastic. Oh, and another option is come to our farm and harvest some Cornelian cherries plant the seeds, and then you can graft your own Cornelian cherries. And we have videos on how to graft. There you go. <laughs> As you all have so yes, much time. <laughs> the Cornelian cherries are very easy to graft. Uh, so back, let's talk about more about the Asian pear production. Um, how, how spread out in the year are the harvests of the different varieties? Ooh, uh, and that, and I know that the Korean giants go into October. Are they pretty frost tolerant on the tree? Uh, yes, they are. In fact, the, the leaves can go through a pretty hard frost and and still stay green and continue contributing to the ripening of the fruit. Um, the earliest ripening variety that I'm, I'm aware of is Hosui, which ripens in August. But Hosui is extremely blight susceptible, and I, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm not even sure if we have any hosui fruit left alive. You wrote backwards. Yay. I think it comes <laughs> across right on the screen. It comes, actually, I can see it fine. Yay. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> now, Shinko and Nijiseki ripen in September. And then uh, hosui, suli, and suri ripen in October. Was this a Shinko? Um, yeah, that's Shinko. Okay. And I know, uh, you know, you might get an Asian pear in the grocery store. This happened to me last year and it's not very flavorful. Yeah. Um, so we've got the water balloon flavor on the un, un, uh, the, the un, uh, thinned fruit. How, how would you describe the flavor of the Asian pear? How do you sell it to your customers? Um, oh, that's for the that you it. We tell them just taste, taste under each of the trees. And if you like how it tastes, then you can harvest from that tree. That's the beauty of you. Yeah, we, uh, we don't have to uh, sell the Asian pears. They sell themselves. And a lot of our and, customers uh, ask for them. They already know. They a want lot Asian of our pears. customers are Asian and and are already very familiar with Asian pears. And uh, the ones who aren't um, will usually while they're picking up something else like chestnuts under the trees, they'll come across an Asian pear, bite into it, and then they want Asian pears yeah. also. And it is important to taste because of the overproduction, a tree that normally is sweet and flavorful will actually taste a little bit. The weirdest one I had was Fruit Loops. It tasted like Fruit Loops and I still don't understand how it tasted like that. And I didn't really like it. And others taste it like bananas. I'd never experienced that before either, but I, they kind of liked what they were tasting. So I was like, hey, whatever you like, you bet. All right. And, and what price do you sell you pick for? Mm. And, and how might that compare to a market setting where you are harvesting and bringing them somewhere? I think, I think we're charging $2 a pound for yeah. you pick. Uh, and that, oh, that's considerably lower than what yeah. you would pay in a supermarket. But then this again, is almost a pound. So that's about a $2 Asian pair. We don't have to pick them and sort them and wash them and refrigerate them and <clears throat> and package them. The, the customer picks them either from the ground or from the tree and takes them away at the end of the day. So uh, and another it, it's just like a bonus for us. And one of the cool things about Korean Giants is it does not need refrigeration. It will keep extremely well at room temperature. We had one Korean giant that Tom had sliced off a bad spot and he left it in a fruit bowl. 
And I have learned don't throw away things that Tom set out. And so we left it there for four months and the sliced area had healed and he ate a little bit of it, it dry, later. Dried. And it, it, it tasted like, what did you describe it so as? The, the dried part tasted like pear candy and the mm -hmm. rest of the fruit, even though it had been sitting at room temperature with a hunk Big cut off of it, um, was still just as juicy and wholesome as And it we have fruit was flies. The day it came from the tree. But there were no fruit fly maggots thrown on this guy. Ow! That was impressive. And the other varieties you would recommend storing in the fridge after that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the, <clears throat> there's a there's as much variability in the storing quality of Asian pears as there is with apples. So like some are apples, even in refrigeration, only last a week or two, whereas winter apples can last up to a year in refrigeration. I have to save the rest of this for Dean. No. All right, I got another question. How long does an Asian pear tree take to start into production, harvestable production? Um, well, the first Asian pears we planted uh, were on a pyrus usuriensis rootstock. And uh, I think two years after we planted them, they started producing fruit when they're only about four feet tall. Mm -hmm. So it th they can be pretty quick to come into production, but it'll depend a lot on the rootstock that they're grafted on. And the, probably the best rootstock for Asian pears is a pyrus betulifolia, but um, uh, I think that's one that's gonna be really hard to find. The, the nursery we were getting those from went out of business a, a couple of years ago, and I don't know of any sources for pyrus betulifolia now. Um, Asian pears can be grafted onto European pear as a rootstock, and uh, a lot of them are grafted on Old Home by Farmingdale. Uh, <clears throat> European pear rootstocks, uh, such as uh, OHXF 97, 87, and 333, but some varieties of Asian pear don't do well on European pear rootstock, like, like Nijuseki, for example, is severely dwarfed and uh, will have a very short lifespan on a European rootstock. And do the uh, the nursery you recommended, they'll be knowledgeable in helping producers work through that? Um, You'd hope so. Okay. okay. I've, I've never had to ask them, but, I'm, but yeah, I believe they probably would be knowledgeable about the various rootstocks. And, and Cummins doesn't have a wide selection of Asian pears, but the ones they do have, they sell at a very economical price for a commercial grower anyway. Whereas the Rain Tree and One Green World are um, retail nurseries that sell their trees at a pretty steep price, but they have a very wide selection. And another question on here, and I'm, I'm scared to ask you because I think I know the answer. Is there any way to treat uh, fire blight on, on these trees? Um, it, it can be prevented, uh, um, especially, well, commercial growers will use a, a antibiotic because the, the disease is a, is a bacterial disease, not a fungal disease. So uh, antibiotics can be sprayed on the tree to prevent it. But uh, once it hits the tree, the antibiotics aren't, aren't really gonna help. So it, it, it works as a pre preventative, but not a cure. Uh, the best cure for fire blight once it hits a tree is just a high level of blight resistance in the tree, the genetic resistance. And then do you cut out the dead branches? Um, you can. If on a, on a susceptible tree, when the disease hits, it races through the tree and clear down to the, through the trunk and down to the ground very quickly over a matter of sometimes just a matter of days, it, it'll kill the whole tree. On resistant trees, they can still get the disease, but instead of spreading, it becomes very quickly isolated and just stops spreading through the tree. And that, that's the best, the best thing for controlling fire blight is planting resistant varieties. Yeah, not get it in the first place because it can really spread quick. Um, I got a question here. Uh, Asian pears, will they grow near walnut trees? What what kind of, I know you have some walnuts around. Uh, are there any of your crops that don't like to be neighbors? Yeah, apples and pears should not be planted near walnut trees, near black walnut trees. Um, 
And uh, near uh, near would be within touching root zones, or how near are we? Yeah, about? yeah, yeah. Within the root zones of each other. And bear in mind that a a tree's root zone will extend two and a half times beyond its strip line. So. How about heartnut trees? Yeah, heart, heartnut trees. Or heartnuts are a type of walnut that produces uh, only a tiny fraction of the amount of juglone that a black walnut produces. So you could probably grow Asian pears around uh, heartnut trees without any problem. And I, I have one more question, then we better get to wrapping up. Um, what kind of pruning, pruning is needed for an Asian pear? There's thinning, but is there also any off-season pruning? <clears throat> um, they do need pruning, uh, especially the, uh, vigorous upright growing varieties need pruning mainly to keep uh, their height under control. Um, but uh, it, it's just a fraction of the pruning that apples take. I, I have to spend about an hour pruning a dwarf apple tree. And it, it takes me uh, uh, often less than a minute to prune a standard pear tree. And do you primarily do that in the and winter late, similar late, to apples? Late, late winter, although it, it, uh, it might be better to actually do it in July uh, if you want to reduce the amount of pruning that you need to do every year. Mm. As, uh, July pruning results in less regrowth. Right. As pr late winter pruning results in a lot of regrowth that has to be pruned off again next year. Right, so get, get the, uh, the summer pruning to stop the the regrowth rather than the yes. winter pruning. Great. Cool. Well, we are at 105. We are past 105. So, Salise, I'm going to ask you to pull up our closing slides here. Um, Tom and Kathy, first of all, thank you so much for putting those videos together and for all of your work educating all of us about the, the very interesting and profitable and uh, crops that we hope become more popular on the Iowa landscape. Uh, you guys are such a such a treasure for us. You're welcome. Hey, we're happy to do it. We love PFI. <laughs> and everyone on Facebook, thank you so much for attending this live event today. If you want to rewatch or share this with your friends, you can find the video of this event, uh, their previous Tom and Kathy's previous field day on honeyberries and all of our other field days um, on the PFI website. There's, uh, there's uh, recordings there on our YouTube channel and, of course, on our Facebook page. You can also sign up um to receive day of event reminders for all of pfi's virtual field days i find that i want to attend one and then forget it um but it comes to my inbox and then i i jump on that day it's pretty easy to get there i don't have to drive so salise has put a, put that link in the chat box and you can sign up on there we won't use your email address for anything else it's just for virtual field day reminders um i'd also like you to take a few minutes to complete the evaluation that's in the comment box for participating, you'll be entered to win a PFI water bottle, but more importantly, we'll receive your feedback and we really, really uh, value that and use it. And we haven't seen the last of Tom and Kathy. We'll be back here with Tom and Kathy on October 7th to check in on their chestnut harvest and take a run around their pawpaw and American persimmon crops as well. So looking forward to that. And until next time, stay healthy, help out your neighbors and enjoy the sunshine. <laughs>